Hey everybody, it's Sunday and that's Q&A time. Thank you all for dropping in. I always have to wait to make sure my audio is working and hopefully it will be, but we'll wait for that to come in. Sounds like a bit of a lag. Hello Kiwi Robin. Hello everybody here in the chat. Hello Rafa. Like and a bit of a lag. I've got sound, which is great. Okay, today, uh, as you know, it was a, a very upsetting week for many and a large part of this session will be dedicated towards talking about wallets, the alternatives to Ledger for all different assets, how you can do it yourself, how you can take these old phones and turn them into wallets, and a whole bunch of other good stuff. Uh, we're also going to talk a lot about options because Bitcoin and crypto have been kind of quiet. People want to sharpen their skills, so we're going to go into a lot of option, option strategies, leap strategies, shorting strategies, some of the math behind it as well. Um, I'm going to talk about my daily routine. People want to know exactly what it is <laughs> and uh, be careful. It's no fun. And uh, then what are we going to talk about? Some other proxies, etc. leap buying. Um, yeah, that's it. So let's go. Uh, and of course, none of this is financial advice. Thank you all in the chat for being here. And the questions, of course, come from Patreon. Um, and it's so funny. Every week, the mood in the room is different. This is Patreon. They gave me a mug because this is the biggest finance community on Patreon. And the best, <laughs> no doubt about that. More alpha shared in this community every day, bar none. Anyway, let's go. First question is from Eric G. I noticed that Google was trading outside of the standard deviation on the Bollinger Bands and is well above the mean. Combining this with the macro headwinds, I was thinking about buying puts with an expiration date of October 20th. Is this a good move? So there's a couple of things that are interesting about that time frame. One, between now and October, there will be volatility. There will be the summer doldrums, but let's analyze a couple of things. One, let's look at October options. So uh, I had a quick look at at the money. So Google is trading exactly just under 125 right now. The calls for October are 10 bucks, which means you need Google to be at 135 by October to break even. And the at the money puts of 125 or a dollar cheaper at nine bucks. That means your break even point is 116. So you need Google to go to at least 116 before you can even start to think about making money. Of course, volatility drives everything else. And the implied volatility of Google is 26.1. We'll be talking about a lot about implied volatility today. I should have recalled the video implied volatility, but we'll see why. Now let's look at the chart and what you're talking about. This is the Bollinger Band for Google. And you can see we are way, way, way outside that Bollinger Band. Also, you can see some other indicators there too, like buy and sell signals and everything else. So yes, correct. We are outside that band, which typically means the price is overbought. But there's other things happening in the marketplace right now. Now let's look at uh, the layer out model here. This shows you, it's funny because we are bouncing off that 125 level, which is resistance, which is a time to, you know, for the asset to take a breather before it tries to climb to the next level or simply be rejected off the 125 level and mean revert to the 115 level. Coincidentally, that's exactly how things are priced right now for the for the options. Um, the 125 level is at layer seven in the layer out model. It has 10 layers. There are ones that are a lot higher. And again, this is based on the actual volatility of this actual asset. And uh, it's fun to use this model to tell you exactly where things are and how, <laughs> how confluent typically resistance and support levels are. So this will give you an idea as well. Looking at layer six, if you bought your put option for October at the money, you'd want Google to pierce layer six before you can even think about making a profit. So uh, that's important to know as well. Let's look at one other chart. Let's look at the signals of, is Google going to turn down? This is looking at a thing called IADSS. So first of all, at the bottom, the mean reversion, you can see it's way overbought. It's way off the charts from where it normally lies. A red dot will be coming soon. It's not there yet. When the red dot comes, it typically means it's going to turn down. Then you have the sell signal. It's light red, which means the sell signal is coming. This is on the daily chart. So it probably will turn down in the near future, but the trend is still strong. 
And that is the only thing kind of keeping us on the fence right now. But sometimes it takes the trend, especially on the daily time frame, a long time to turn around. So that's why we look at the four hour and then the one hour and then the 15 minutes. And that helps us dial in exactly when to get out of the position or go short, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, there's a couple of things we have to take into account regarding Google. One, it's an AI play. And you can see, as I said, I think yesterday, crypto is tired and AI is wired. If you look at the searches for AI on Google, obviously nobody's looking for metaverse. Nobody really cares about Bitcoin. It's at like a low level now since, well, oh, last time I hit this level was kind of November 2022. And before that, we got to go all the way back to 2020. Again, you know, even seeing the vibe at the Bitcoin conference, it's like mm, nothing like it was a year ago. So, but AI is red hot and this can inflate assets to a certain level. In fact, I started analyzing yesterday peg ratios for all the top AI stocks to see which one is the cheapest. And a very interesting name came out by the name of Tesla. If you want to play AI, it is the cheapest name out there compared to others. And another view is NVIDIA. Uh, the price is preposterously puffed up. You can see here the price to earnings ratio is 182, 189 actually at one stage on Friday. And the price to sales is over 29, call it nearly 30 which is insane. We're back to uh, dot-com bust levels of October 2000. So it is kind of insane to see. Uh, so the problem is because the narrative is so strong and it can inflate assets so high, way beyond where they should be, this means you could be in danger buying a put on Google. If you have a long position in Google, I much prefer the strategy of selling a call because then you can always roll up and the money's in the selling. And remember the final point on this one as well is the markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent from John Maynard Keynes, top economist. So with that, I would not buy the put at $9. Yes, you might make a little bit of money, but I'd wait for more of a spike and get more pricing action and then sell a call. So next question is from Trucks. What are your thoughts on buying deep in the money leaps? These are call options, but over a year plus in time frame. So don't let the term leap confuse you, but they're just basically long-term call options. Uh, but buying them on Tesla and MicroStrategy. In a previous video, when buying a call option, you mentioned the option price ratio staying under 35%. Does this ratio also apply to deep in the money leaps? And when would it make more sense to just purchase the stock versus buying these leaps? This is a great question. And there is no cut and dry answer to anything in the markets when you involve volatility. We're going to talk about volatility today because this drives the options price. And we're going to dig into this a little bit. So first of all, MicroStrategy implied volatility is 70. It's that's actually 69 point something. Can't quite read this. Just call it 70. It's basically 69.44. And this means in any given period, and that's a 30 day implied volatility, it can swing that much. By the way, the implied volatility for Tesla is exactly 43. I think I said Google was 23 or 24. So MicroStrategy is super, super volatile. Not only is Bitcoin volatile, but MicroStrategy swings way more than Bitcoin does. That's why we created the uh, MicroStrategy ARB Cloud, which takes advantage of that. Uh, let's talk about how volatility drives option price. There's a couple of simple things. You know, we have a Black Scholes model if anybody wants to see it. Let me know. Um, but here you can see I just highlighted in green what volatility is. And the main takeaway from this is it is incredibly important to look at volatility when you look at the option price of a stock, okay? And this is because the option premium, which is the price you pay for the option, is a percentage of the underlying stock price, okay? But when you buy a call option that is trading at whatever price, the key is when you have that little green squiggle, the sigma, and when that is high, that drives a ton of pricing action. So the C is the call price equals to that formula. The only thing you need to focus on is the volatility. The higher the volatility, the higher the impact on price. Now, the other X factor is the longer the time to expiration, the more the volatility can play, and therefore the price has to be larger. That's why you typically 
sell these things. You don't buy them because they're so, so expensive. Let's look at some illustrations as to why that is. This is MicroStrategy. These are in the money leaps out to 2025. And if you look at the price on the left, uh, you will see the strike price. So it'll be 25, um, whatever that date is, strike price $135 and 140, 145, all the way up to 280. Again, we're talking in the money leaps. Now, what I did here is mapped out the actual strike price of the option, the blue, which goes up linearly because they're in $5 increments up until 200 bucks. Then we go $10 increments because there's not enough volume to support $5 increments after $200 for this asset. For things like Google, Tesla, yes, there is. The other thing is the ask is the price of the option. That's what people want to sell it for in red. And yellow is the break-even point that I calculated for you. So if you go to the very bottom, you will see if you buy the $280 leap today, the asking price is about 120, 130, and it'll call. You know, you will not make a profit on buying this leap until the price of MicroStrategy goes to $405. That's the yellow thing at the bottom. If you buy the $135 call, your break-even is 316. Which isn't, which is about $30 above the actual price of the stock today. So, yeah, you'll make money on that. But does it make sense to buy that? And per this chart, you will see here one of them is mispriced. That's what I typically look for when I look at options pricing. I run through the model. You can see here the $155 call is very, very cheap. You can actually break even by buying that under the price today. These anomalies go away pretty fast because people like me buy them up. That's a cheap option to buy. If you had to buy a leap, you would typically buy the one that has the lowest break even point. So I'm pointing to the 337 there, the cheapest option. So that gives you an idea of how these things work. Now to answer your question, what makes sense to buy? So I did another chart to visualize this. Okay, Blue is the intrinsic value of the option. That's how much if, if the strike price is $100, and the stock is trading at 280, you're gonna be buying at least 180 bucks of intrinsic value, okay? As the strike price goes higher, the IV goes down up until the break even point. Second part is the time value. You don't wanna spend a lot on time. You sell time, you don't buy it. But if you're buying a leap, there will invariably be some time. And you guys know how I overcome paying for time in the community, because I do it all the time. That's my go-to strategy. and. Finally, the other piece is the, 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 the important piece here is the yellow. And that means I have it written as margin. Margin means buying the stock on margin. You put half down, you borrow half, okay, versus buying the actual call option. That's the delta between both in yellow. And again, you don't want that to be too high. In a perfect world, the simple way, rule of thumb, is you want IV to equal time value when you buy leaps. But when the volatility is so high, like MicroStrategy, they're too expensive to buy. The simple answer is you buy them on margin. You buy the stock on margin, it's way cheaper. And then on spikes, you sell the calls against it. You sell the time because it's volatile. And that's how you make killer money in the market. That's what made me. <laughs> so uh, next question is from Honda Nier. Um, can you channel your inner Don Draper and give us some quant observations on the what Tesla sales would net after kicking off a new advertising program and thus the stock price out to 2033? Will Tesla be able to have free ads on Twitter? So uh, it's, well, let's, let's go back for a second. First, I had to Google who Donald Draper was and he's apparently a TV show guy. I think he was a marketing executive, etc. And I pulled one of his quotes and people want to be told what to do so badly, they'll listen to anyone. Okay, people want that hopium hit. You see actually this same stuff happening a lot in crypto. You know, tell them and then they believe and you sucker them into buying something they shouldn't. So this is kind of maybe part of the magic. So that's my synopsis of Don Draper. I could be completely wrong. Next, uh, if you look at the top three spenders, and this will not be a quant answer because it's impossible to verify exactly what the benefit is. And I explain why technically I believe paying for advertising 
for Tesla would have pretty much no impact. But the top three spenders on ads of all industries are cars, automotive. Second is FS, uh, financial services, life insurance, pumped very hard. And pharmaceuticals, pump those drugs, ladies and gentlemen. Inject everybody. Yes, that's what they want. And that's why they spend so much on it. And that's why it was such a blessing over the last two years, because they didn't have to spend anything on sales and marketing. The governments did it for them. Now, next is the car industry. Some fun numbers, and this will blow you away. Uh, first of all, car companies spend 10 to 15% of revenue on sales and marketing. Okay? Sales, pushing, pushing cars, pushing advertising, turn on the TV, whatever, watch a Super Bowl, it's all car ads. General Motors spends five times the amount on sales, marketing, and GNA than it does on R&D, research and development. And GM creates ads on sound systems, not the car, and the ads are incessant. By the way, this is a review of the Wagoneer, Jeep Wagoneer, I think it's General Motors. And they said here, even the sound system, the infotainment system, repeatedly resets. Forget all the danger stuff that happened with this car. The car is complete garbage. It costs $90,000. And they advertise it all the time. And they don't do anything about how much gas it burns, which is really bad, and how unreliable it is. It's all about the sound system. Who would buy a car because of the sound system? It's kind of ridiculous. But it's the only leg they can stand on. And that thing from Macintosh doesn't even work, just based on reviews I read, allegedly. So that's kind of crazy. So do you want Tesla to be in this bucket? I don't know. And I always say, uh, treasures tout themselves, so good stuff sells themselves. And turds are marketed with high intensity. Again, if something is pushed on you hard, marketed hard, think of the cost that goes into the product to market it, whether it's 15% or 25%, and sometimes a lot higher. It all becomes marketing, marketing, marketing. You don't want to buy a product that you're paying for that marketing. That's the real issue. Tesla sells itself. So the other thing is when I, we talk about Tesla, I shared this recently, twice actually in the last three or four months. If you can cut the price, your TAM explodes. So this simple illustration here, which is courtesy of ARK Invest from Good Car, Bad Car. But basically the message is, if you cut the price in half, you increase your total addressable market by 16.6x. Demand is a function of affordability, not desire. I think Elon Musk said that himself. And this is what they need to do. Cut prices. You don't need sales and marketing. Demand will take care of itself. That's it. This is the whole issue. You know, when, when Tesla brings a car down to 25k, Demand will be to infinity because nobody else can reach that price point for what you get with the car. And so my conclusion is don't advertise. I know they might try it, but they don't need to. And back to your most important question, Hondonier, should they use Twitter to advertise? Yes. And I've got some ideas for that too. What they should do is basically crowdsource people on Twitter or on YouTube or whatever to build their own ads and Tesla maybe offer a free Tesla giveaway every month for the best ad and pump it on Twitter. That's it. Doesn't cost them anything. They own the platform. Game over. <laughs> so Elon Musk, if you're listening, that's your solution for advertising. Save money, give back to the community, and you'll get the best ads ever. That'll be entertaining, I guarantee. So next question is from Jilly6868. I never see USAA in any of your bank charts. Is this bank doing okay? Great question, and it's good to be concerned about where you park your money. We'll talk about self-custody in a minute, but this is important. Just first of all, USAA history, real quick. It's a, an operation in the U.S., been around for over 100 years. Your balances are insured up to $250,000 from FDIC, and it wasn't affected at all by the last financial crisis. And the reason is 72% of what they do is insurance, and this stabilizes their portfolio. 72% of their revenue is insurance. Banking is only 28% and 0.2% from other things. And the average bank balance is under 100 grand. So it wasn't uh, exposed to the same exposure that Silicon Valley Bank was with very high net worth individuals. First Republic, high net worth people with, you know, half a million dollar, multi-million dollar balances. And all those balances drained, especially with concerns. USAA doesn't have that because they have a solid customer base, which typically stem from military as well. In addition, I pulled the financials from year end 2022. Just as a comparison, you can see they got 1.3 trillion in assets versus First Republic Bank, 
Total liabilities, just under, called a trillion dollars. Net equity, 313 billion. Net income, 5 billion. Return on equity, 15.4. So they are very profitable and they do very, very well. Part of it because they are mostly insurance. So don't worry about those guys. Now, back to the top topic. And I did a ledger video. I'll put it here after. And uh, it was very well reviewed and it should be because people, once they find out things could go awry, they get very, very concerned. So this next session, we will talk about wallets, self-custody and everything else. And I want to say something as well. We're going to list off some wallets that we believe are the best. We have somebody on the team here, Mr. W. He is a wallet expert. He builds his own wallets. And a big thank you to he or she, not giving away any identities, for putting this together and helping us as well. But this is not a promotion, you know... <laughs> After. Anyway, it's just, be, but be careful. Things can change very quickly in the space as we learned with Ledger last week, which was a trusted asset. So first of all, first question is from Matt BC. In view of recent events regarding Ledger, its hardware wallet, closed source code, and the issue of potential risks related to seed phrase recovery, would it be possible to provide an update on comparisons to include currently available hardware wallets, AKA what is an alternative to Ledger? Well, let's jump in. So we're gonna go through this quick and we've done many, many videos. Uh, we'll share the, uh, the wallet security playlist up here after, very, very important you guys. And we'll talk about the importance of that in a minute. But first of all, the all round uh, best all purpose option for everybody on average is one of the original crypto wallets in the space been around since day one. The device is extremely reliable and the company is extremely reputable. The code is open source and extremely well documented. And that's why we believe Trezor Model T is the pick for the best all-purpose hardware wallet. It's coin support and its integrations. It supports over 1800 cryptos, we think, uh, last count. And if you trade a lot between different cryptos, then Trezor is the way to go. Additionally, Trezor is the second most, has the second most number of third-party integrations just behind Ledger. And most applications such as Web3, MetaMask, CoinSwaps, and other crypto wallets typically will have an integration to Trezor if they support hardware wallets. It's also very beginner-friendly and has an intuitive interface. And they do have coin join, which is a nice privacy feature, but I'll talk about that in one second as well. And in the long term, this is, we believe coin join can be a, a nice feature for making things more private for people that want to kind of stay off the grid. But coin join is not without its controversy. So there's a lot of backlash out there from Maxis and others. People are mad about the coin join and Trezor partnership because they believe it could compromise the privacy of their Bitcoin transactions. And not really, but what it could do, and this is kind of the issue, is some people are concerned that CoinJoin and Trezor partnership could lead to Trezor being targeted by law enforcement or governments interested in tracking Bitcoin transactions. They also worry that the partnership could make it easier for governments to force and attack uh, the, this kind of area of a wallet. So governments don't want to not know what you're doing. As we've learned over the last couple of years, governments are behind everything. They're in Twitter, they're in Facebook, they know everything about you. So for those who are extra paranoid about privacy, this is a good thing, but it could make you a target of the government as well. That's the backlash from CoinJoin. Just want to address that issue too, to make sure you are aware. I'm not that concerned about it, but other people may be. Next, number two option is the best versatile option, as we call it, is Bitbox02. By the way, I have never had so many wallet questions in my life as I had since Wednesday of this week. Literally hundreds and hundreds in the community. So thank you all for the questions. We took them all in and we created this little summary for you. So Bitbox02 is a great wallet, extremely ver versatile, open source, well-documented, reputable. It's ticking all the boxes for us, tick, tick, tick. Uh, it integrates with popular wallets, software platforms, and it supports Shapeshift as well. Um, and it also, Bitbox02 also has a Bitcoin-only version for Bitcoin purists, which reduces the attack surface area. And it, it doesn't have the coin support. 
uh, as Trezor, Model T, or Ledger, but it's a great all round for both Bitcoiners and all coiners. Let's go for number three is Blockstream Jade. Uh, Blockstream Jade is one of the easiest to use and the most convenient options for storing Bitcoin. And it's only 50 bucks. And if you are on a budget and you are not technical, then this is probably the best option for you. And the only thing to note with Blockstream Jade is it's Bitcoin only. So you'll have to get another key for your other coins going forward. But as I say, sometimes it's not bad practice to have multiple keys. But again, make sure your OPSEC is buttoned up. Next, best minimalism option, Cold Card Mark IV is our minimalist option and in security minimalism is always the best as there's not much more minimal than the cold card and cold card is often regarded as one of the top choices for advanced security focused users it's completely air gapped open sourced and well documented however it's not for beginners uh, or the non-technical so be careful of that as well now, this is one that we've had a lot of questions about, and we did a video on this in a Q&A a few months ago. I don't remember where it was, but it's somewhere. So search AirGap and how to build your own wallet, etc. This is pretty cool. It's airgap.it is the best DIY option, by the way. And by the way, if you've got any of these old things lying around, as I mentioned, you can build your own, which is really cool. So... Uh, it is open source, iOS and Android software that turns your old phone into an offline hardware wallet. It supports a variety of crypto assets, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cosmos, Polkadot, Trezor, Kusama and a few others. And the software is free. Uh, you do need to pay, I think, for a compatible iOS or other Android phone that you can use as a deactivated device. And it's not too complex to set up. But if you have an old device sitting at home, as everybody does, I can't tell you how many I probably have. Uh, this is a great option. You basically do everything for free. Now, a quick flow through for those who want to set it up. It's super easy. You download the AirGap Vault to your offline device. You download it to your online device. Remember, you need two devices. And just follow these instructions. Pause the video, etc. The online device creates a QR code. Scan it. Done. Bingo. It's pretty neat, pretty easy, and it's worth uh, playing around with again, but uh, you don't even have to be that technical to do this too. So hope that helps. Now we've got a couple more questions regarding wallets because everybody is burning about this this week. So Yolo C said, what is your take on multi-sig for Bitcoin maxis? Either where you hold all the keys or using a third party like Unchained with Caravan, you could still use your Ledger wallet as a key. So good, good question. So multi-sig for those who may not remember, multi-sig is definitely recommended if you hold a lot of Bitcoin. It's a security feature that's available in most wallets where it requires multiple signatures to authorize a transaction. For example, you can configure the multi-sig to require two of three signatures with distinct private keys before a transaction can be executed. And this means that if one of the three private keys is lost, you can still use the other two private keys to move the crypto. So consider it like a little safety airbag uh, for your crypto security. And remember, you can imagine that there could be many ways to use this secure key to use your crypto. So for example, if you create a two-third multi-sig and keep one for yourself, give one key to your loved one and seal one in your will. Hence, if ever, heaven forbid, you are incapacitated, your loved one could still access that crypto with their key and the key with your will. So yes, definitely recommend to use multi-sig. Uh, the question now is multi-sig with custodian. While you can simply give one key to a loved one and seal the other, a better option is to incorporate, again, if you have a lot of Bitcoin, a multi-sig custodian into your system. And this is a third-party service provider that can help you create the multi-sig and or hold one of your keys for you as a service. Unchained Capital, I think, is a great option here. Unchained will custody one of your multi-sig keys while you hold the other two. And since it takes two to unlock your Bitcoin, Unchained will never be able to move your coins. And then you could give one of your two remaining keys to a loved one or a seal it in the will, etc. And this way, again, if you become incapacitated, they just need to be able to reach out to Unchained. 
Now let's look at Caravan real quick. Unchained Caravan is a great tool for creating that multi-sig address. Caravan is a stateless, open source, and flexible multi-sig coordinator, and it does integrate with your hardware wallets. And the way it works is as a coordinator, the software can be used to deconstruct a wallet and turn your device into multi-sig wallets. The Caravan is stateless. It does not itself store any data outside your current browser session. And it's a great way to quickly and securely build your multi-sig strategy. Uh, we'll drop a link for the documentation on this as well. So you can read through it yourselves. But uh, this means basically the good thing is your keys are never stored in the cloud. They're always under your control. It's transparent because Caravan is open source and it's standards based as well, uh, following all the industry standards for multi-sig uh, addresses. So with that, that's a, a good option for sure. Next wallet question is, in light of recent Ledger news, what are your thoughts on Keystone hardware wallet? It's open source, supports a large number of coins, and it also has a Bitcoin-only firmware version as an option. So another great question from BRI. So Keystone wallet, you see here the price, 119. It is a great option as a Ledger alternative. It's designed to be completely air-gapped from the internet with its Vault feature. This allows users to store their assets in a secure, offline, and air-gapped environment. And this cold storage solution adds an extra layer of protection against potential online threats. Its security also has a combination of multi-layer encryption, secure elements, and hardware security modules to protect users' private keys. And you can also add 2FA for security as well as an added layer of security. So from that, it's rock solid. In addition, Wow, this, this is kind of stunning. I, I, <laughs> everybody's talking about Keystone as the top option, and it is extremely popular this week in the community. So its token support is pretty mind-blowing. 5,500 coins and tokens, 200 blockchains, 25 software wallets, etc., And pretty much uh, everything. It also supports Solana. A lot of questions regarding uh, does it, what wallet can can replace Ledger and still support Solana. So this one does it too. So nothing but goodness about Keystone. In addition, Keystone's firmware open source on GitHub, which is a huge plus, but there are a few tiny downsides. One, it's a relatively new project compared to other wallets. You know, veracity is important. We talk about that a lot. Um, we don't know how battle tested it's been. Also, the user experience is very different from typical hardware wallets, relying on a QR code scan, just like your air gap. However, there wasn't any major red flags that we could find, and it seems to be an excellent wallet, definitely worth picking up. So just bear that in mind, it's very different from others. Final wallet question for you from you all this week and there were hundreds uh this is uh, following your ledger update video could you review the safe pal wallet as a possible alternative from jgi so it's not all unicorns and rainbows i'm afraid safe pal wallet yes uh, it is a crypto wallet it uses a secure element chip to protect your private keys it's got an easy to use interface it does follow bip 39 seed phrase integration uh, SafePal also offers a mobile app that allows you easily to integrate with your hardware device. And the app enables you to view your portfolio, send, receive crypto, etc., and interact with Web3 directly from your mobile device. And it's also cheap. Here you see $49.99. And in the past, Ledger was basically the only hardware wallet available and looked that it was kind of not open source, etc. But there is a small problem with SafePal. So it's not open source. So from that perspective, it gets dinged in our book. And let's recap why this is what we recommend. And again, our wallet expert is extremely <laughs> obsessed with security. So first of all, the key elements, and I touched on this uh, last Thursday as well, for any wallet, you need security, you need air gapping, you need cold storage, and you need pen protection. You need to make sure it is open source. You need to make sure firmware updates do exist. And you make sure it's easy to use, but not too easy. And veracity. Battle-tested Keystone, maybe not around as long as others, but still looks solid. But these are some of the elements that you need to have on your checklist as you go forward. And remember, when you are your own bank, 
you're responsible for your own security. Okay, so really work on your OPSEC, tie everything down, make sure you have no attack surfaces and be safe out there, especially as the price of things like Bitcoin go up. In fact, Bitcoin has been quiet. $26,908. It's still beep flatlining like I discussed yesterday. So nothing too exciting. And all the money is going into <laughs> meme coins still, sucking up all the liquidity. Next, our, I think it's our final question, a stove dialer, stove dialer. Yeah, I don't know how you dial a stove. Interesting name. What is your daily routine? Any tips on managing energy and focus along with this downtime for best performance in this blood sport? So uh, the simple ways, well, I will walk you through my agenda, but one of the things that really is important if you love what you do, it's easy. It's like you wake up excited at 5.30 in the morning to go to work because you love what you do. If you don't like what you do, it's painful. So as we always say, pick something you enjoy doing. So I love this, as it should be pretty clear. So first, uh, again, my agenda is not fun, and but I do believe it's a critical time. The next three years are going to be so important for all of us. So I do as much as I can while I can. I was retired, came out to do this, and here I am, and I've I worked pretty hard, I'd say. And I'm not saying I do this to the exact minute every day, but it's pretty much extremely close to what I do. First, I break everything into thirds, as you know. The first third, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. 6 a.m. I wake up, sometimes earlier, sometimes a few minutes later. I make coffee. I check the markets. I check the community. I check my schedule for the day. I wear pretty much the same clothes every day, so it's easy to set up the night before. Uh, no complications there. Um, at 6.30 a.m., empty all inboxes, monitor stock market, open crypto movements, check trading view alerts, etc. 7 a.m., read about 300 articles. 8 a.m., run three to five miles, TRX, etc. That's so, so important. And then 8.45 more coffee. I also hydrate a lot in this time. So that is kind of the first third, very active, high energy, get a lot done. Uh, second third is from 9 to 4 p.m. I check on the team, prep content for the day. Um, again, typically the schedule is prepped in advance, so I kind of know what's going to happen, like Tuesdays or Okta, Fridays are kind of interviews, DCA is tomorrow morning. Uh, I check on the community, make posts for the community, share what I see. Um, at 10.30 a.m., I finalize content. That takes many hours. Sometimes it takes 8 to 16 hours to create content, but I do it in blocks over many, many days or weeks. And uh, 12.30 to 1 o'clock, give or take, however busy the day is, I eat my veg vegetable blend and I shower. <laughs> Funny thing is, I actually don't shower till right before I stream. Might be too much information, but that's what I do because I don't have to go to the office. I, uh, at 2 o'clock, typically I stream during the week. Uh, weekends is 12 noon. Uh, 3 o'clock, respond to questions. 4 o'clock, I do admin, banking, real estate, account management, calls, meetings, etc. And the final third is 5.30. I stop and I start prepping dinner and cooking dinner and eating dinner. So that is kind of like my... My relaxation time, I find it very therapeutic to cook. Eight o'clock, work on less important tasks, you know, light research, answering emails, comments, questions in the community, and planning for the next day. About nine-ish, I go to bed. Sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 11, it depends. I wake up at 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. to check the markets. That is my routine <laughs> every day. And remember, the other question you had was, how do you focus? Uh, you got to have at least six hours sleep a night. Very important. You got to eat very healthy. You got to stay hydrated. You got to take frequent short breaks. I like a little five minute break, walk around outside in the yard, check the sprinkler systems, that type of stuff and avoid distractions. When I'm working in the zone, it's quiet. When I'm working not in the zone, sometimes I multitask and listen to stuff at the same time. Uh, but normally if I'm reading, has to be very quiet and stay very fit. I find the brain works much better when you are physically very fit and you eat very well, high energy foods, mushroom coffee, this guy, and um, vegetables, powered by vegetables. So hope that helps. And again, it's a brutal routine, but again, <laughs> three more years and then 
over. Uh, let's go. Helping animals. Uh, favorite part of the show. This is Rowdy. He's a marmoset. Rowdy is very people-oriented and loves to greet folks uh, to mimic <laughs> the tropical climate of his native home in Brazil. Rowdy's exterior, exterior space contains a mister and large interior bedroom. Features an evaporative cooling system, so we take care of care, food, shelter, medical, etc. For Rowdy. So big thank you to everybody who makes this possible and the team that does makes this happen as well behind the scenes. So thank you so much. Let's jump into some questions right now. And uh, we pull them up. Hope everybody's doing well out there. You can split your sleep just as you... Yeah, you can. Like I... You know, people say you need a constant question there. A constant six or seven hours. No, you can get up and check things. Although some people say it's a bad thing, but I just do it anyway. I couldn't... I, I just wonder. Because sometimes crazy things can happen during the night. Clint Alexander. If the US and Canadian government switch to a CBDC system, how will we be able to use our Bitcoins and other cryptos after that happens? Will they be able to render them unusable in the future? No. Well, first of all, CBDCs are coming. There's no doubt about that. Uh, they'll need that control. Unless, of course, you have a very, very radical government leadership that puts their foot down and bans them. We have a guy called Ron DeSantis in the US. He basically wrote into law banning central bank digital currencies, but laws can be reversed pretty easily. Now, no matter what happens, humans are very intuitive. Black markets will always exist. There'll always be a fiat on-ramp to crypto and an off-ramp from crypto back to cash. It just depends how you do it. And I also believe more and more stuff will happen off the grid because people will not want to be uh, kind of monitored, controlled, censored. Uh, people think that's kind of an invasion of privacy. So I do believe the future will be much more kind of peer-to-peer -peer bartering, peer-to-peer -peer payments with things like crypto. It's like, you know, if I have a plumber come to the house, you say, can you give me 600 cash instead of a check? You know, that type of stuff. There'll be ways around it. So um, again, in summary, CBDCs, they are coming. Governments want to monitor every penny and that will cause humans to be creative and find ways around it. So don't worry too much. They will not render your... Bitcoin and crypto are usable in the future. Again, everything's going decentralized. Just the government uh, is running at the speed of government and they haven't figured out yet they can't control it. They'll try. And the sheeple uh, will be under that iron fist, but the rest, no. And uh, it's kind of funny to see how <laughs> Western economies are moving to the Chinese model. Strange. Anyway, iron, thank you as well for being here. Um, Sir Manus, please share your crap strategy. It's complicated. It's a model I built in the 90s of exactly how to allocate across different assets. What I do, uh, real quick, I count the series of numbers that I know craps and roll of dice is very random. But the real secret is as soon as I start to get above, get profitable, I start betting more aggressively across more assets. So basically, think of it as I only play aggressive with the table's money. When it's with my money, I play very conservative, get to the point of making money, and then I go really aggressive. And uh, that's it. But the crap strategy itself is a lot more complex than that. And I would not be able to <laughs> share it here in a couple of minutes. Cat with a K. What's the most daredevil thing you've ever done? Like skydiving, bungee jumping, zip lining? You know, I've never done zip lining. I've done skydiving and bungee jumping. I never did because I came off a motorbike at a young age and uh, I hurt my back. So, uh, and I also smashed my back on a half pipe snowboarding. Um, so I was always afraid of popping my spine on a bungee. So I never did it. But uh, that's it. Um, let me see. Daredevil thing, I guess. Uh, riding motorbikes very, very fast. Um, and skydiving, I guess. But uh you know, it's pretty safe, but I wouldn't do it today because back then I was like 21, 22 years of age. And now it's more risky. As I get older, I get a lot more conservative, I drive a lot slower too. William Barbier, were you able to watch the rugby game of yesterday between Leinster and La Rochelle? I have not. Uh, I used to watch rugby early morning. There was a, a bar very close to where I lived in San Francisco. And I used to get up at 6 a.m. and watch the rugby there, but I don't have TV. So um, 
I and I am too busy to even think about streaming. And as you saw from my routine, I don't have the time to watch TV or sports. I do sometimes save Formula One racing. I have an app and I can watch it on demand. So if I'm working out, uh, I watch the Formula One racing. But that's the only sport I actually watch right now. William, uh, thank you for the question. And sorry, I wasn't. It sounds like an exciting game. Maybe I'll try to watch the kind of highlights. Uh, MT, you are the man. Thank you for being here. Um, and KN, thank you for all you do. And Super Sticker Kiwi Robin. And remember, DCA is on tomorrow on CTO Larson's channel. Uh, we are kicking around some agenda items today, so it'll be interesting. I um, put together some uh, very interesting topics, I think. And also, if anybody wants to know something from, you know, it'll be Scott Melker, myself, CTO Larson, and Ivan on tech. If you have a question for us, let us know. Ran will be in a plane flying back from Miami, so he will not be there tomorrow. So it'll just be the four of us. But drop a comment below if you want a question answered on DCA or ping me in the Patreon community. Um, good. The better the question, the more intriguing the question, the higher the probability it'll be answered. So I want to thank you, everybody, for letting me do this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the super stickers that we try and improve the world with every single day. And with that, I will love you and leave you if I can figure out how to turn this thing off. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks all as well to the mods in the chat. And thank you to K8 and Kiwi Robin and everybody else for keeping us safe. I'll see you all tomorrow morning, bright and early at 7.30 a.m. Pacific, which is 4.30 Sweden time. That might be Central European time as well. I'm not sure. The time zones are kind of different. So thanks all for being here. I'll see you tomorrow morning.